issues and communications, emerging media, and cultural forces shaping our society. Guests have included legendary newscaster Ted Koppel, John Keonis, news correspondent and host of What Would You Do?, and our own CCIM alumnus, Grammy and Oscar Award winner recipient, Tierra Thomas. Mr. Letterman has personally invited and hosted conversations with media icon and philanthropist Oprah Winfrey. Tonight, we add another illustrious name to that list. David Arquette has been a household name in Hollywood for over 30 years. The youngest of the Arquette acting dynasty, stretching all the way back to his great-grandparents, David recently reprised his role as Dewey Riley in the relaunch of Scream, which I have never seen because I cannot watch a horror movie. <laughs> so I trust that the rest of you know it's good. Because it had a number one opening weekend, he is also known for his modern classics like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Airheads, Johns, Never Been Kissed, Ready to Rumble, and 3,000 Miles to Graceland. How many of you guys seen some of those? Yeah. <laughs> David recently joined the cast of Peacock's Mrs. Davis, a drama series written and produced by Tierra Hernandez and Damon Landeloff. He's recently seen in the thriller Spree, um, and uh, he will be seen in the storied life of A.J. Prickery. I think I'm saying that right. He has been success he's successfully produced TV series like Cougar Town and Celebrity Name. Arquette is an investor in XTR, the leading premier nonfiction film and television studio in America, which has produced the critically acclaimed feature documentary on himself called You Cannot Kill David Arquette, which follows Arquette as he attempts a rocky return to the sport that stalled his promising Hollywood career. Dangerously determined to redeem his reputation and reclaim his self-respect, Arquette stopped at nothing to earn his place in professional wrestling. I understand Dr. Weaver might be taking him on in a cage match later. <laughs> David also shares a connection to Ball State University as a certified Bob Russ painting instructor. Yeah. In 2021, David realized his childhood dream and acquired the rights to Bozo the Clown. Since then, he's been collaborating with clowns, artists, and charities to create a clown collective focused on promoting kindness, inclusiveness, and pure fun throughout the world, something he also shares with Ball State University. We look forward to pure fun with him tonight. Please welcome David Arquette to the stage. enough that's enough you're too kind I'm gonna let you in on a little Hollywood secret when an actor wears glasses he's smarter <laughs> <laughs> not really my eyes are going though I learned that today in one of the classes when I was trying to do a teleprompter so uh, I don't think I need them necessarily that says just keep laughing <laughs> that uh <laughs> That was Bozo's, uh, Bozo the Clown, one of his sayings. Uh, I was a huge Bozo the Clown fan as a kid. And I was also a graffiti writer, so I wrote that. There's little tags in the background. And then I have a little clicker here. We're gonna click to the next one, but look at that. <laughs> this might be part of the reason why I love clowns so much. This is my family without my sister Rosanna. She had already moved out to Los Angeles to start a career on her own. Um, that's my father, Louis Arquette, my mother, Marty Arquette, Alexis Arquette, who was transgender, was originally Robert. That's me. What's up, Dave? That's my sister, Patricia Arquette, and that's my brother, Richmond Arquette. Uh, my dad dressed up as Butter the Clown for all my birthday parties. And then I was like, uh, you know, Butter would be there, it'd be great, and then he'd leave, and then my dad would show up. I said, Dad, you just missed Butter the Clown. 
happened for years, <laughs> far longer than it probably should have. <laughs> Especially since in therapy, <laughs> something came back to me. I was like, oh, I remembered the morning of this. My brother Richmond did not want to be a clown, hence no white makeup. And he was sort of fit. And uh, my dad, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, and my dad had gotten a free picture at a bank. <laughs> if you opened a bank account, you got a free picture. So <laughs> we showed up like this at, <laughs> at the bank. But before that had happened, I, I had this repressed memory. And I was like, oh, no. I, rem I saw white makeup on a, on a pillow. And then uh, it all came back to me that I had, I was crying at something at the end. And uh, I think Butter spanked me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was tragic. <laughs> my dad didn't spank us a lot. Uh, my mother, <laughs> on the other hand, uh, it, she's an incredible person, beautiful uh, artist, poet, but was abused as a child and abused a lot of us, uh, spanking, hitting, like bad, bad kind of stuff. Uh, she had a beautiful trajectory in her life. On her deathbed, she passed away when I was 25. Um, she was on her deathbed and she had been doing interning, got all of her hours to become a marriage family counselor. And during one of the lectures, she was sitting watching one of these people, and she kind of had this, like, let me out, let me out. She's screaming as if she was sitting over there, and he's doing a lecture. And everyone's like, what? They said, don't be concerned. What's happening now is a repressed memory that's coming up in, like, at this moment. So he started to walk her through it. So my mother uh, had a lot of abuse as a child, but then she faced it and she, uh, you know, we dealt with it as a family in addressing it through therapy. Uh, she addressed it personally by learning about it and healing and, and providing therapy for a lot of families. So on her deathbed, I said, Mom, look, you got your diploma. You're a very family counselor. You graduated life. And... Uh, stop the cycle of abuse and really that's really what it's about. I think like uh, as silly as it sounds like Oprah and all of the sort of evolution that we kind of went through during that period really got people talking about abuse, talking about their situations, being able to talk about it. So started off light. <laughs> <laughs> this is my great grandfather and great grandmother and I also think Leo Clark, I think he's related to us because Clark is our Irish side of our family's name. Um, so that's Augustus Arquette. He's playing a Jewish character and he was not Jewish. I am Jewish, I'm half Jewish on my mother's side. Uh, so he, he was the happy Hebrew in the Galloping Gazette or something like that, Galloping something. Uh, Gazette, I don't know. Uh, we, it's like history, we've only gotten little bits of it. So this was in Toledo, Ohio, uh, in vaudeville stage there. They had a little act. But as you can see, it, they didn't have a lot of depth. <laughs> I mean, even though it's like painted back there, it was a pretty dingy operation. So uh, he ended up committing suicide, sadly. Uh, the rumor is that he had contracted syphilis and had given it to his wife and couldn't face it. I don't know if that's true. It was during the Depression. Sorry. Real upbeat feelings here. <laughs> also great people. <laughs> Just a hard, some good people make bad uh, decisions sometimes. So this is my grandfather. Uh, Charlie Weaver was the character he played. His real name was Cliff Arquette. And he was... Uh, on the original Tonight Show, uh, Jack Parr show. Sorry, David Letterman. <laughs> <laughs> Beat you. <ya. laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, 
So he played this old man character. He's younger than me in this picture. So uh, that was early on. And then he, uh, he toured at first with a, with a, like a traveling vaudeville band. And then, um, and then he transitioned to radio. And he had a radio show where he created this character, Charlie Weaver, who was an old man character uh, with the short tie and the, and the suspenders. His hat got smushed even more in the future and glasses. And he could kind of get away with like saying kind of risque jokes back in the day because he was, you know, this wild guy. I mean, old guy. Uh, that's my mom. Uh, that's when she was a burlesque dancer just a couple of times or, or like a play or something. But uh, I was 18 and I found my mother nude in a book. <laughs> yeah, I was like, mom. <laughs> Mama, I found her naked in a, sh a shower, uh, and then a few pages later, there were four pictures of her cat fighting in lingerie with another woman. And I said, Mom, we have something to talk about. <laughs> Explain yourself, young lady. And she looks at this and she goes, well, you know we weren't fighting. <laughs> we weren't really. We weren't really fighting. <laughs> I was like, Mom, I don't, I just, what is it? She's like, oh, yeah. Well, I had to, you know, I was a young mother, and I had to make money, and they called them cheesecake photographs back then. I was like, so you were like a, a pinup model. And she's like, yeah. And, uh, and then we discovered the name she went under, which was Brenda Deneau. And then all these things <laughs> came out where she was a star in Olga's House of Shame. Yes, <laughs> Olga's House of Shame is one of John Waters' favorite films. Uh, so <laughs> it's pretty, like, you know, exploitation film kind of thing. But um, uh, so I talked to her about it. She was really like, yeah, my mom was really a sweet person. She had a heart of gold and um, really had a, a bit of a tough life. But I asked her, I said, well, Mom, did you ever strip? Because, I mean, earlier in my life, I was quite a strip club person. I know. I'm sorry. I'm not proud of it. I changed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> no, but I would, like, go to the buffet, you know, at lunch. Just get some wings. Some, you know. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> just to, to explain it a little more, I saw my friend, this guy named Jingle Jared, who does jingles. He's like, David, how are you? Do you remember where we first met? I was like, oh, uh, no, where? He said, crazy girls. I go, well, that kind of makes sense. He said, do you remember what you were doing? And I said, I was tipping the girls. He's like, yeah, with Target cards. The house can't take their portion is the idea behind that. And they could use it for other things. <laughs> yeah, I had a problem, but <laughs> I'm healed. <laughs> but I said, Mom, did you uh, uh, ever strip? And she said, no, I, but I did burlesque dance. I said, you burlesque dance? Did you have a burlesque dancing name? And she said, Bootsy Bellows. <laughs> so later on, I'll explain. I named a nightclub after her called Bootsy Bellows. Uh-oh. Oh, here we go. So that's her and some of her uh, photos from back in the day. That's my father, Louis Arquette, another uh, wonderful actor. He was uh, the narrator in uh, Waiting for Guffman. He was on The Waltons as well. He uh, was an improvisational actor. And I'm going to take these off because, uh, well, I can't see you as well now. <laughs> but I can't really see anyone. But uh, he was an improvisational actor that worked with Paul Sills. And Paul Sills uh, was the son of Viola Spolin, and she was sort of the uh, mother of, of uh, modern day improvisation. So I got to study with him and with my father, and uh, I learned a lot from Paul Sills. So I still utilize a lot of uh, improv in my acting style, I guess, <laughs> my <laughs> acting style. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, there it is. So they did this thing called Story Theater. Uh, Paul Sills uh, directed it. And my father was in it, and they did this play in New York, 
And then we started doing it as kids. There were little things like Henny Penny, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And we'd all, you know, act it all out and we're singing songs and dancing around, all these uh, kids. And then I was born, uh, I was born in uh, Sky, Mon uh, well, it's called Front Royal, Virginia, I believe Fairfax County at the hospital, but we lived in Front Royal, Virginia. And I was born on a commune. Uh, my parents were hippies, beatniks, really, and then kind of hippies, and then uh, sort of took off toward the end of the 60s to sort of escape the, the end of the whole hippie thing. And they went to this commune in Virginia, and it was based on a religious philosophy from a guy named Bapak, is what they called him. And uh, it's called Subud, it's called Sicily Bodhi Dharma. Uh, it was, uh, he, he created it in uh, Indonesia. You can be any religion and be a part of it and practice it. Uh, but Sicily Buddha Dharma is like, uh, so it's from Indonesia, and one side of Indonesia is Islamic, and the other is Hindu, Bali. So it's Buddhism, Hindu, and Islam is sort of where he got his basis for the philosophy. And then my mother was Jewish, my dad was Christian, and I'm born on this commune. So I, my whole concept of God and like uh, spirituality and religion was kind of all over the place. We would do Hanukkah, and then we would do Christmas, and we would do uh, Ramadan, <laughs> wake up in the morning and fast. And, uh, and one thing that was great was uh, Subud uh, has you know, different communities throughout the world. So when we did, uh, were able to go on to camps, they made sure they, they were like in other parts of the world, which, uh, which gave us a sort of overview of the sort of world and the religions that we were looking at. Oh, and just to wrap up the, the Subud thing, um, it's based on a thing called Ladihan, which is called spiritual exercise. You're not really supposed to, it's supposed to be word of mouth, so I guess this is word of mouth, <laughs> but whatever. Um, men go into one room, women in another, which also probably has to be readdressed at this point in our society. Uh, or, you know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but, um, so you're supposed to surrender to God, and then, you know, release, and then God's supposed to guide you uh, with your personal gift and how you can take that out and make into the world and make the world a better place. So he saw all these people that had moved into the middle of nowhere and he comes to visit them from Indonesia and he says, what are you doing here? <laughs> Why did you isolate yourself in the middle of nowhere? This religion's about, you know, finding your personal gift and it's not a religion, it's a, this philosophy is about finding your personal gift and going out in the world and making it a better place. So you should if you're an actor, you should be doing where, where they're doing plays and, and movies. And if you're an architect, you should be where they're building. So it broke up the, <laughs> the commune. A few people stayed, but uh, we didn't. That's me and Alexis. We were really close. That's me as a baby with my godmother who came to visit from Indonesia. That's what it looked like. That was the, uh, the commune, all the kids. Those are all the... Uh, my dad was in a band at that period of time. That's my godmother and godfather up there. That's Hamilton Camp, who was a big folk singer who was also there with us. That's Rich, my brother Richmond, Alexis, and me, and Skymont. And that, then we moved to Los Angeles. Well, we moved to Chicago first. So from Skymont, he broke it up. We moved to Chicago. And in Chicago, I fell in love with Bogle the Clown. I was a little kid. and. Uh, just like that last picture, I was about, right? This is right before we moved. We went to Chicago, and Bozo was everything in Chicago. It was, you know, 1974 or something. And uh, I just fell in love with Bozo and everything about it. And then we went to uh, Ringling Brothers, and I somehow kind of connected them. It's like, this is Bozo's big show or something. And Lou Jacobs was there, who was a really beautiful, funny old comedian. Uh, clown, and I got his poster, which I still have, and I just loved it, and I loved the world and how it made me feel. I really felt like Bozo was my pal, 
And I just don't think there's a ton of that out there right now. Um, so this is the house we moved into in Los Angeles. Uh, it was on Gower Street. It was a half a block down the street from Paramount Studios. And um, that had a big impact on us because we were right down the street from Paramount. Uh, I used to walk over there when I was about seven or eight alone, stand in line and watch Laverne and Shirley, Happy Days, and Mork and Mindy all be filmed at, at the thing. They've let me in alone. <laughs> then one time I waited after and I was sitting there and then after and the, and the Fonz came by and shake, shook everybody's hand and I was like, oh my gosh, the Fonz! And then on my first day of Scream, I'm work, uh, it was one of my first days of Scream, and I'm working with Henry Winkler. And I said, I saw you as a kid as Fonz, and I, sh sh I shook your hand. He said, well, let me shake your hand again. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, he is, Henry Winkler's one of the greatest in Hollywood. Like, there's certain people uh, along this journey that I've met, Paul Rubens, Quincy Jones, um, you know, just people that, Henry Winkler, that are just, they mentor people, they, they're generous, they're kind, they're, you know, they have control of their emotions. Uh, so this is the house we moved into. Um, that's sort of what I looked like back then. Um, and that also, when I got into ska music, I really got into Scott. That was probably, oh, no, this was right before we went on a, a, one of our, we did like, I think three trips as kids, but it was really impactful. And my mom really, she was great about sort of, you know, getting all the deals and making it so we, we could all go. But uh, when we went there, we got, I was into Scott when I went there, and then I was like, it just evolved more, got into Bob Marley and, you know, the Clash, all these, you know, your, uh, English influences and Rasta. So, yeah, there, that's when we went to Paris. It's Patricia. That's me and Alexis. I was really close with Alexis. Alexis was one of the most incredible artists I've ever met in my life. I her so much. We, uh, <laughs> uh, Alexis, um, we shared a room growing up. You know, everything going on right now uh, with the trans community is really, like, it's just really heavy on me. That's part of the reason why I'm emotional right now. Because uh, we had to deal with a lot of it. Like, it was really hard. I shared a room with Alexis my whole life. At 12 years old, Alexis moved into the closet. Didn't come out of the closet, moved into the closet. <laughs> it was a craftsman house and uh, at the apex. Oh, you can see it. <laughs> oh, let's see. <laughs> Look at this. Okay, so the apex of the house, right on the side there, there's a little teeny window. You can't see it, but it's a little teeny window. And it had three drawers below it. So Alexis uh, moved in there, moved all his stuff there in a single bed, <laughs> and it fit. And Alexis lived there until, um, until uh, she essentially like uh, was a chrysalis and a butterfly came out and was Alexis. And then moved into the room that Patricia had had previously that had the bathroom and our room was in the middle. So then Alexis moved into where Patricia moved. And, uh, and uh, one of the things when somebody comes out and says they're trans, it's a real adjustment. There's a lot of adjustment. And you see our country and our world going through it now. They don't know how to do it. It's constant moments of uncomfortable, saying the wrong thing. That happens within the family as well. My mother, who's completely super liberal and like super hippie, was crushed when, when she found out. And it was just gay at the time. She was like, what? It's just going to be such a hard life for you. Uh, she also came around, and we all talked it out. And then we evolved, and then we, then we got it. And then we're like, 
oh, it's about authenticity to who you are. It's about that. And it's their take on it. It's not yours. It's not what you think. If, if you think they're whatever, any, however you see, it's, it's actually not about you. And uh, I don't know. I'm sorry I went off on a tangent there, but um, it's just such an important thing. And Alexis really uh, fought for it. Alexis, at one point in her career, everyone loved Alexis. Gangsters, the, you know, yeah, the club kids, the, you know, all, like super tough bikers. All the, everyone loved Alexis. So Alexis was like this, like, person that could go and, like, you know, go to the punk rockers and then go to the gangsters and be like, listen, you guys. <laughs> you know, they're like, what is going on? We just, people that didn't know what was going on would be like, <laughs> because Alexis just had this thing. But then she decided at one point she wasn't going to act unless it was a female role or a trans role. And her career really dried up after that. She really was very hard for her to work. Even when she passed, the Academy wouldn't put her up on the thing, even though it was a trans year. It was the year of like Moonlight and stuff, so, or something like that, or like whatever that year was, it was a big year of inclusivity, which they didn't include her. But um, I love you, Alexis. And that's my brother, Richmond, who's also an incredible writer and actor. Uh, he's amazing. He, uh, Yes, my favorite credit of any actor. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'll go back to that. Alexis, just to, <laughs> as an actor, we want to give credits. Uh, Alexis was in uh, The Wedding Singer, played uh, Boy George, was also incredible in a film called Last Exit to Brooklyn, where she did get to play trans. Oh, uh, that's, that's my brother Richmond. So Richmond has the best credit of any actor. He's the person who delivered the box in seven. <laughs> What's in the box? I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> that was Richard. Re uh, David Fincher puts him in a lot of his films. He's a really tremendous person. That's my sister, Rosanna, my sister, Patricia. Rosanna really, really, for this generation, kind of broke the doors down for us. Um, you know, how long? Where are we at? Uh, so a half hour? We, 20 minutes. Okay, good. Um, sorry. So uh, she really broke down the sort of walls for us to make it in, in it. My dad, obviously, he was a character actor and, and acting the whole time in Chicago doing industrial films, uh, a lot of commercials. But uh, she came out and ran away from the commune when we were there. Uh, 15 with a friend and came and ran out to LA and moved in with a family friend. So they weren't like, you know, alone, but uh, she heard about a, a, an audition. Uh, I was going to do it, but <laughs> that would be too traumatic. <laughs> she heard about this audition about an epileptic, epileptic character. And she went into the casting office. She didn't have an appointment. She sat there all day. And the casting director came out at the end of the day and said, I'm sorry, uh, what's your name? Do you have appointment? She's like, oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't have an appointment. I just wish it. <laughs> she started having an epi epileptic seizure and got the role. <laughs> yeah, got to work with Betty Davis shortly after, which was like a dream of hers to work with Betty Davis. But I can't say enough about how she really did, you know, you know, then she did Desperately Seeking Susan and the Big Blue and the Executioner song. Just after hours, oh, New York stories. Her work, and it's a really rough, rough business because she's, you know, it's hard for her to get work in general. It's hard for all actors to get work. But the fact that she's not getting, like, the choice roles, she's so tremendous. And then my sister Patricia, who is, like, crushing it right now, we're all so proud of her. But it's a, a weird thing, you know what I mean? I want both of my sisters to be crushing it. You know what I mean? I want everyone, you know? I really want everyone to win. I don't know if y'all are like that, but I think we all should be like that. <laughs> I, think, I think in the future we can work toward that.
There's just so much division right now. So that, that uh, another clown, but that's, uh, that's me <laughs> as a graffiti artist, uh, 1986 or so. Uh, this is my crew. <laughs> it was like we were KGB, the kids gone bad. <laughs> yeah. No relation to the Soviet uh, Union. <laughs> Soviet Union, look at me. <laughs> Russia, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, this guy's a really big graphic artist now, Zephyr. And yeah, G man. Oh no, his brothers are. But another uh, member of the crew has uh, got an incredible show right now at La Louvre in Santa Monica, and that was my. High school teacher, Ben DeBaldo. Ben DeBaldo changed the course of my life. So I was a graffiti writer like that. My sister is Patricia starting to act. I'm like, forget that. I ain't doing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't, I don't want to, you know, what? But then these girls came up to me in high school, and they're like, we can't find someone for the school play. <laughs> they're willing to pay someone $500 to do the school play. When they're going to Pally to get this guy, you get to ride a motorcycle through the auditorium. I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you got to uh, sing. And I was like, I got to sing. So I was like, OK. So I go up and I do like, I'm a type of guy that'll never settle down. <laughs> Where pretty girls are, oh, well, you know I'll be around. And uh, my friends are in the back, like totally making fun of me. But I'm like blocking them out. I got the part because no one else was up for it. But it did change the course of my life. I, at the end of the play, went to Ben and said, Ben, where's my cash? <laughs> he said, you don't get paid for school plays. I was like, what? They told me I was going to get paid. And he gave me a couple hundred bucks. I did repay him in the, in the future, uh, so you know. And then he was honored by the Creative Coalition at Sundance about a teacher that uh, had a really important impact, so thank you, Ben DeBaldo. He wrote a um, play called The Seventh Son, where my motorcycle breaks down outside of a woman's jail. <laughs> yeah, and I have to stay the night till help gets there. I end up kissing all the girls in the jail. <laughs> it's a disaster. I don't know how we, I don't know how we did that at a high school. This was my first job. But it gave me the confidence. So what happened was Ben, he said, I want you to do this uh, showcase. Uh, I did a humorous monologue. And we, did it, we worked on it together. We went. And it was Southern California Teachers Association. We all wore numbers, so it was real anonymous. And, um, and I scored second to a woman. So I feel like I was the first guy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Listen, she was playing, it was a woman playing God, which I loved. I was like, and I thought she killed it. And God's just got mad at me. Uh, <laughs> so then it gave me enough confidence to then really kind of like, okay, I, maybe I can do this. You know, maybe it's not just, you know, nepotism. <laughs> I'm a nepo baby, by the way. I just really, I'm fourth generation nepo. <laughs> So this is my first job called The Outsiders, and it was based on the S.E. Hinton movie. Oh my gosh, thank you. It wasn't the movie. We did the Fox, the Fox television show. Fox is this new network. You guys should all check it out. I think they're going to start doing news, too. It's amazing. No, uh, <laughs> no they had just started Fox News, uh, Fox Network, and we were one of the first uh, people on it. And this is Jay Ferguson, me, Harold Pruitt, Rodney Harvey, and Robert Russler. Rodney Harvey and Harold Pruitt both died of drug overdose. Yeah, it was really sad and harsh. Rodney was a kid from Philadelphia, who got discovered by Paul Morrissey, and then uh, came out to LA. He's just a uh, like, <laughs> he was incredible. And so was Pruitt. Both of them were these amazing guys. And uh, yeah. 
make the right choices. Then we did this movie, Johns. That's Lucas Haas, really incredible actor, dear friend. And this is kind of where I broke, uh, like, I got to Sundance uh, my first time. I play a street hustler. Scott Silver wrote and directed, who, who uh, wrote the new Joker movie. And, um, and it was just a really great experience because I got to research the role for three months, which you never get like that kind of stuff. And I got to like talk to all these people who were street hustlers. And uh, you know, it, it informed me. I, I got, I said, I had a list of questions I'd ask of like, why are you out here? What do your parents think? How old are you? Do you drink? Are you on drugs? What's in your pockets? It's the craziest thing that ever happened out here. So they just start talking, we start talking. I met one kid who had a, a tattoo teardrop, which I used in the film. And then I saw him afterwards and he was all gone and he had been shot by standing on the side uh, of the street. It's really rough for these hustlers out there. And then that led to screen. Yeah, this is really an amazing experience. I met with Wes Craven, and uh, he was like, um, he's, well, I was looking at some of the other roles, the Skeet role and uh, Matthew Lillard role, and um, I said, I, I really think there's something interesting about Dewey. <laughs> I, thought, I love the idea of playing a cop that gets no respect. <laughs> And I like, can't get authority, like nobody, ah, it never really gets it. But uh, that was really funny to me. And then I wanted to work opposite Courtney Cox because I, I had a crush on her. And, uh, we did this film, uh, we dated, flirted, whatever. And then Scream 2, we were like on and off and it was real drama, passion. <laughs> I hate you. I love you. I hate you. I love you. So, so, um, so we flirted uh, during uh, Scream 2. She just hated me. She hated me. She was so upset with me. And uh, I had a band at the time, Ear 2000. Woo! That's right, that's the name, that was the name. It's that bad that you opened your mouth like that. Ear 2000, 1999, band. We had a small window, but we got two platinum records because Wes put me on the soundtrack to Scream and Scream 2. Yeah. Wes was like super supportive. He loves music in general. and. Uh, he was really supportive and kind. Just the fact that he even let my band on those two albums was an experience. So that's, uh, there's Wes and me and Cordy. We're still really great friends. We have an 18-year-old daughter, Coco. Um, yeah, yeah, she's going to go to, she's taking, yeah, she will. <laughs> By the way, she, she was, she's, Taking a year off, she's gonna go to New York next year, but um, she's like questioning New York now, so maybe <laughs> I'll put in a good word. <laughs> I know, I, I can hardly get her to like visit me. <laughs> it's hard when they get older. <laughs> but she's incredible. At some point, as a parent, I don't know if any of you other parents feel this way, at some point you just, I, I just go, are they good people? Are they kind? <laughs> Are they going to be, you know? Ah. And once that is answered, it's really, you know, you kind of did your job. You want them to, you know, thrive. But uh, So Wes was really sweet, and on Scream 2, I was, my mom was dying. I was having a really hard time. I was uh, going through stuff with Cordy. And he kind of sat me down and gave me a really fatherly moment. He was like, David... I really want you to get your stuff together. I know Courtney likes you a lot, and I really think you guys can make something work. You're a really tremendous guy, great actor, but you got to get your life together. You got to have to do that, or none of this stuff's possible. And it really did help, you know, change the course of my life. That's Courtney. That's. 
She dressed up like that because I dressed up as Gail Weathers. <laughs> and I ran on set and I had her dress on and I had like a, it's probably, you couldn't do this nowadays, but I had a trench coat on and I went like that and then I had her dress on. <laughs> so then she did this. I was like, oh, hey. So no one's ever seen that. <laughs> that's my mom and dad. I don't know how that got back in there, but uh, that's just some funny shoot he was on. Oh, yeah, there, that's my mom. Yeah. And that's my whole family. That's Thomas, uh, ex-husband of Patricia's. That's uh, Zoe, my niece Zoe, uh, Rosanna's daughter. And, uh, uh, yeah, this is the whole, all the siblings. And then I did see spot runs. I told her to put it in there, but I was like, I think they probably saw that as kids. You guys, this was years ago, right? I don't know. You might have seen it. If you didn't, you're missing. It's a masterpiece. <laughs> but the funniest story about this is, you know, Earlier, you saw the Johns that said a 90s Midnight Cowboy. I love Midnight Cowboy. It's one of my favorite movies. I'm watching this documentary on the casting director of Midnight Cowboy. Cast all the great Warner Brothers movies. It's amazing. I love this story. And then they started having me cast shit like this. <laughs> it comes on the documentary I'm in love with. And I'm like, wait, wait, I'm the poster child for bad acting. <laughs> Which is okay, I guess. <laughs> yeah! Woo! Ah! <laughs> Thank you. So sweet. That movie did not get that reception when it came out. <laughs> this has gained in time. Thank you, Blockbuster Video. Um, so that's Diamond Dallas Page and Chris Canyon. He's also passed away uh, from suicide. Um, Diamond Dallas Page is an incredible person, super motivated, uh, inspires people to lose weight. We did this movie to promote it. They had me go wrestle with WCW, who was a competitor with WWE at the time, and they made me the champion. <laughs> I was not a professional wrestler, and they made me the champion. <laughs> the professional wrestling community for 20 years hated me for this. Uh, then I started a, um, a clothing line called Proper, P-R-O-P-R. -R. Uh, that's David Bedwell and Ben Harper, musician, were buddies. Started this clothing line, poured a bunch of money into it. Um, it tanked. We learned a lot. <laughs> it was three years. And it was amazing. We got a golfer at the Masters to wear it. But uh, that, was, that was the swan song for that one. But I learned a lot. Like all of these things, even though you kind of, it's a big flop and you lose money, and you learn a lot. <laughs> you learn about the garment business. It's really fun. I mean, shady. That and the music, <laughs> it's super shady, the garment industry. Oh. Be like, yeah, we did it. We shipped it. It's there. It should be there Tuesday. Where? It's not here. Oh, yeah, it's just, we're just boxing it up. <laughs> they, they just canceled the order. Thanks, bro. Uh, this is Dirt. This is one of the first uh, films we, I mean, TV shows we produced at FX. It was about a tabloid journalist. It was a really great experience. Then Cougar Town was another thing we produced. Not as great an experience. <laughs> End of marriage. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it happened. But uh, it was actually, you know, at the time, at the time when I was completely devastated, crying my eyes out. To Zac Efron, in the morning, who I don't know that well. <laughs> and for some reason had chose to call him. I have his number for a good reason, not this reason. <laughs> I called him a ball and out. I don't know why it was Zac Efron. It was just, I don't know, some weird drunken. <laughs> I don't drink anymore because to me drinking is ego juice. 
<laughs> just makes me, yeah, yeah. How you guys doing? Hey, what are you guys up to? <laughs> yeah. This guy, you guys want a party? Let's go have some fun. You guys want to have some real fun? I got some Target card. <laughs> I forgot all about the mic, too. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, Cougar Town was the end of it. But, uh, but then as I'm so devastated, my whole life is crumbling. You know, I, I, can't, I don't want to get into all of it. There was this whole thing that happened, and I was being blamed for it, and I, w I wasn't the one doing it. And, uh, and then I got a call from my, <laughs> from my uh, publicist that said, you're on the cover of us magazine it says he's a cheater it's like <laughs> howard stern <laughs> i call up howard stern oh wait <laughs> i don't know <laughs> that is not howard stern <laughs> that's when i played frankenfurter at the rocky horror picture show <laughs> oh, we got some we got some fans <laughs> Yeah, that was a really, I could make the pasties uh, go in opposite directions. <laughs> uh, so I called, oh, not, that's not Howard Stern either. Okay, sorry. So I called up Howard Stern, and I was drunk. I have a nightclub. I was up all night at this night, uh, you know, nightclub, and you come home at like 3 o'clock, you're still kind of drunk. You know, one hour later, they go up live. I call Howard Stern drunk and just... Fill my guts and like make a fool of myself, say things I'm so embarrassed about still. But the point was so that they wouldn't put, I'm a cheater because I wasn't the one doing it, <laughs> you know? So it was really kind of, but I still got blamed for it. So I like, ah. But in typical alcoholic fashion, I was like, okay, let's burn it down. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to equate a little hair. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> All right. Here, I owe you a Target card. <laughs> I think you told me. I think you told me. Uh, was that white? No, yeah, I was an honor. That was a dream come true. After that, I'm sorry these stories are kind of all over the place. After that, I took, yeah, it's kind of name drop, a lot of name dropping. But we took Sting's kids to this because uh, Courtney's best friend is Teresa, who's Trudy Sting's wife's assistant for years. They all worked at FBI at a New York, uh, you know, record company back in the day where they met Sting. Sting kids. Long story. I bring everyone to the thing. I go to take everyone out. And then Sting, who's not even there, pays for the dinner, which is typically a nice thing. But I, for some reason, started crying. <laughs> but he's not even here. She don't understand. I was just an honorary clown. She was like, uh, it's just a free meal. I didn't, uh, I really like picking up the check. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, oh, I do a lot of work with Feeding America. Yeah, Feeding America is amazing. For three years, I, I did work with them. And, uh, when you can find a celebrity that's willing to do advertisement for nothing and you connect it with an incredible charity and an incredible corporation, magic can happen. Then you get these free ads from, like if Tom Cruise and, you know, whoever, every, all of them started doing this, it would raise so much money for these different charities within a three-year time period of changing America's second harvest to the name Feeding America, because that's what we were doing. We were just doing a real name change. But we got Shepherd Ferry to do a poster for Feeding America and the Ad Council to donate all this stuff. I did a, well, the, visited the Cheesecake Factory. And I'm just saying all this because it is an example of all the things you can do when, when, you, when you can utilize celebrity. We got them to donate a cheesecake uh, for the month of the hunger month 
We got Campbell's Soup to deliver food. It just, we increased their donations. It's in three years, $600 million. Yeah, it was really like, and we stamped it. And we got all these people enrolled in, in food stamps and all this stuff and got this whole feeding program going. And then we got attacked for it. <laughs> like it was a bad thing that people have food. So the Scream 4, that's, that was, that was uh, shot in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It was sad. It was a really hard, hard time. But we threw the birthday of the century for Hayden. Hayden was there, and she was, uh, Hayden Panettiere, she was dating uh, Vladimir Klitschko at the time. God bless Ukraine. And, um, uh, and he, he was not there. He's like, I want to throw the best 21st birthday party ever. <laughs> so we just threw the best party. I'm sorry. So that was when I called into Howard Stern. <laughs> yeah, you see? A lot of good choices going on there. <laughs> then I went and talked about it with, with Oprah, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> Come on, you got to you gotta go full shame. <laughs> and then I did Dance with the Stars. <laughs> I, I did it to kind of like, you know, I was sober now and getting in shape and, um, and sort of rehabilitate my reputation because I had gotten the short end of it. So I did that. It was a really amazing experience. I lost to Nancy Grace. <laughs> She's quite a dancer. You don't know. <laughs> no, she was really sweet. I, I really liked her. That's my wife, Christina. So that's, uh, that's the example, like, if you guys are going through something and it's really hard, it feels like it's so, and it can't go on, just wait. <laughs> you can go on. You can go on, you will go on, and you're going to thrive. Just wait. Just make it through the hard times. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. Because what it made way, it actually happened when I was promoting Scream 4. Devastated, I get onto the elevator to go up to the press junket, and there's this really pretty girl, and I was like, oh, I literally, like, offhandedly thought, oh, well, if there's pretty girls like that in the world, then I, I'm going to be all right. <laughs> I literally <laughs> thought that. You know, I really thought that. And we go up, and I sit in the room, and I, I do an interview for, uh, for um, uh, Entertainment Tonight, and she was a reporter. She didn't do that interview, uh, but I met her then. And then I had saw her again at a 80s boat party. Yeah, it was 80s themed boat party. That was our wedding. Oh, uh, there's our two kids. See, if you stick around and you like really just don't give up, it's going to be all right. You get little rascals if you want rascals. If you don't want rascals, it's even more free time for yourself. And that's my daughter, Coco. And this is just to show you that I'm teaching them all to spray paint. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Hey, look at this guy. I love Bob Ross so much. I became a certified Bob Ross instructor. And then I came up here and did the visit and taught a class. It's just so tremendous. I use it for charity. I uh, do courses like for team building exercises and stuff. That was for Thanksgiving. Oh, I even taught him how to do it. Oh. Yeah, we had a, we did this, you know, uh, the painting. <laughs> Howie Mendel, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't come up with the name for a second. I was like, who is this guy? I know. Jeez, I just can't remember the name of that. Ah, <laughs> oh, this is the crew, too. A bunch of the uh, L.A. crew. Sitcom bag, getting older. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is some graffiti. That bozo piece I did. That's a, uh, got some art. This is Bootsy Bellows. That's a uh, Bootsy Bellows, named after my mother. It's a nightclub in Los Angeles that's been around for 10 years, which is pretty much unheard of. <laughs> we do uh, parties at the Super Bowl, uh, at Coachella, uh, and F1. We have one in Aspen as well. And um, my wife, my friend Mike, 
Uh, we opened a Bootsies at SoFi Stadium for the Rams games. And then we did Celebrity Name Game, which is an amazing um, game show. It's just a really fun world if you ever get into it, if you love games. It's a world where everyone in it loves games. It's funny because in the wrestling world, you'd be surprised. But everybody, even working behind the stage and stuff, loves wrestling. You'd be amazed in the film industry. <laughs> Everybody who's on the set and everybody, they pretty much joined it because they love it. So the point is, find something that you love, like Bob says, and you'll be happy all the time or something. <laughs> is it find, what is it? Find something that, you, so find something to do that'll make you happy. Find something. And you're stuff every day, yeah, someone. And then this is me, Alexis, uh, at a wedding. This is me and Alexis talking. That's so funny. Alexis and Rosanna had a really special relationship. That's Lexi. Ha, ah, that's Lexi. <laughs> Eva Destruction. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, that was a little, a little risque. Okay, so I had a heart attack. Um, this isn't when I had a heart attack. <laughs> but we, this is when we were going to Vegas. So I got in a head-on collision. And I'm sitting there, and... Um, I was being chased by paparazzi, and I sped up when you're not supposed to, and then he sped up, uh, and I lost my, I slid into the other lane, uh, and we were going to Vegas, he said, I guess, I guess this is God telling us we shouldn't go to Vegas, and I said, maybe this is God telling us we should get a G5, <laughs> no, not really, uh, <laughs> I did say that, but, uh, so I had a heart attack. I had a bad reaction to a stress test. Like they went in and put two stents in. Um, you know, that sort of had me look at my life a lot. Um, and then I did this wrestling documentary called You Cannot Kill David Arquette. My wife produced it. She's incredible. We did it at XTR at this studio we've, uh, documentary studio we invested in. Uh, a guy named Bryn Moser started it. He's incredible. Started a company called Riot as well with David Darg, one of the directors. Um, so this came because when I was <laughs> going through my heart thing, when I came out, my wife's like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about wrestling. <laughs> She's like, what? What are you talking about? It's just something that I, it's kind of like something I haven't finished. <laughs> she was like, oh. So that's how the wrestling documentary started. I wanted to go back and kind of you know, just have fun with it. I've always loved Andy Kaufman and like his love of wrestling and his, his abstract comedy. There's just something about like living it and like doing it that's just so weird. Those are the two directors. They did an incredible job. <laughs> yeah. ah. And my wife Christina dressed up as Miss Elizabeth at the end of it because I had this a love for Miss Elizabeth. She was Macho Man Randy Savage valet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the blending of both worlds. Oh, God. That was before I started the wrestling. Uh, that was. Uh, the day of the shutdown, we had, right be day before the shutdown, we had uh, decided to do a, a screening because uh, it got accepted to South by Southwest, but then South by Southwest got canceled. It was 2020, so everybody came to my house. I had a wrestling uh, ring in my backyard <laughs> at the time. That's Jungle Boy Jack Perry, Luke's son. Oh, well, Luke Perry, uh, he was a dear friend of ours, and Alexis and him did a movie called Terminal Bliss together. And while they were doing it, uh, Luke's like, I'm thinking about, uh, is it time for me to, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, we definitely can have extra time for pictures. Okay, sorry, let me just speed through and we'll be done. Um, uh, I did a film called Spree, which is really cool. Yeah, Eugene, that director, writer. He's amazing. XTR, that's XTR. 
uh, uh, they call me magic. Right before the, the shutdown happened, too, we made this deal. That's Andre right there. He put it together. When we got this handshake, it was, you know, it was something we had worked on for a long time. My wife helped produce it with Andre and XTR and the H. Wood Group. But I'm just such a, uh, it was such an honor to do this for Magic, to be able to be a part of it. Such a tremendous uh, figure. And that's the last one. And that was really hard. <laughs> it was really hard to film that. I was like, do these scenes and then um, you have to go. I did this one scene where uh, when I got killed and then I just went back and like sat in my, my hotel room and it was like, you know, still kind of locked down-ish. I don't know, it was just very isolating. And you know, the thing about the screen movies is as an actor, you never really know when your next job's coming. That's kind of a really hard part of it. A lot of anxiety. So it's good to have other things going on while you're sort of waiting. But then when I got to this, I was like, oh, I was reading the script. I didn't know I died. It was like, oh, it's a really good role this time. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> oh, that's why I had so much. And I was like super bummed. Because it was kind of like, you know, if you didn't work in a while, it would be something that would be like, oh, here's a, a, little, <laughs> a little stability. Bye-bye, stability. <laughs> uh, and then Bozo the Clown. I love Bozo. We're bringing him back. That's me and my dad Butters costume. <laughs> and then we introduced the first female Bozo the Clown, Jozo Bozo. And that's Nunu. Uh, oh, my, oh my, my wife had me put this in because she finds it incredibly cringy. The bozo stuff, the clown stuff. She's like, no, I'll never be a clown. That's not him fully, but that's, we're still developing. Then the first step, we do some work within the criminal justice reform space. That's a documentary that's out right now. This is us visiting a prison in Arkansas. God Save Gun Machines is a, Drum Machines is an, another a documentary we have coming out shortly about uh, Detroit techno. So all the filmmakers. And then Mrs. Davis, that's on Peacock on April 20th. And this, uh, this had a, I got it from an audition uh, on tape and they never, you know, I never get auditions that way or jobs that way. And I got it and, um, and then I, show up and I'm super nervous, they're really talented people. And I blow the, the rehearsal and I'm like, they're firing me for sure. And uh, I go home and I study and I come back the next day and I crush it. And uh, she's like, oh man. But it, that's just to let any of you actors know, like that's 33 years into it and I'm super self-doubting. I called my sister Patricia up, I was like, Patricia, does that ever happen to you? She's like, every time, every first film. So, uh, I got to work on Warner Brothers. I spent a lot of time at Warner Brothers because Friends was filmed there and it was kind of my first time working back there. And I'm sitting there and I'm playing a magician, which is a dream of mine because I love magic. And, um, and uh, I get this role and I'm looking up at the Warner Brothers sign and it's just this moment of like, just have faith, don't give up. You know, I have a lot of personal emotional issues and I've had to deal with them but it's really important that you're kind to yourself and one of Bozo's philosophies I'll leave you with this so Bozo we're doing this whole new world and it's about you know Bozo uh, Bozo thinks that you ne should never look up at somebody and think they're so great and you should definitely never look down on somebody think you're better than them you look everyone right in the eye. And they know that you're the greatest in your world. I'm the greatest in my world. You're the greatest in your world. I'm the greatest in my world. We're all the greatest in our world. We have to treat each other with kindness. You can make your dreams come true. That's all I really want for you. How cringy is this? <laughs> it might seem like a hard thing to do, but I've seen it done before, and I'll explain it to you. 
First thing you have to do is love yourself. That's where you find an endless stream of wealth. There are plenty of people that are rich and famous, but most are miserable, and they'll remain nameless. <laughs> dream a dream of happiness, and you will live a life of bliss. Read a book and exercise, and your dreams will materialize. Before your eyes, you'll realize, I can do anything if I try. If I try. But you got to work hard. You're going to go far. Get into the flow and learn where you need to go. Stay on the right path. Brush your teeth and take a bath. It may seem silly, but it's really all about self-care. And beware of saying bad things to yourself. It's bad for you and bad for your health, for your self-esteem, and it's mean. Repeat after me. I'm incredibly special. And kindness is the key. That's it. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. David, I think we, we might have a new theme song that we'll have to perform in the college. So, yes, uh, yes, yes. So, thank you. Thank you so very much. And he also, David, has also agreed that he would stay for pictures. So, if you will line up on the, um, your left side and then come up the stairs, cross the stage, and there'll be photo opportunities for you to take pictures with him. Okay, can I have your attention? Please line up on two sides. David's done this before. He's an expert. He says he will cross across both stages. So we will get that lined up. So lined up on two sides. Okay. We'll get, hello. Oh, that, did you woo me? You woo me. Thank you. So could I have somebody from the staff come to the front of the room to be able? Eddie, please. If you'll leave a row so people can exit, please leave a space so people can exit. Step back. Thank you. And can I have a staff member come to the front of the stage to take the pictures?